We'll get okay. started. Um, welcome to the brown bag, monthly brown bag, I guess, yep. talk that we're doing. Uh, today, Brian Adams is going to talk to us about uh, interests that grew out of his dissertation research. He got both of his degrees at uh, U of I, uh, his own, uh, MA at uh, UIC, and then his PhD down here. Uh, he did put a date down, so apparently it was long enough ago that he doesn't care to remember anymore. <laughs> uh, possibly back in the late Paleolithic. <laughs> um, but his dissertation research really focused on the middle to, to upper Paleolithic transition. And he looked at uh, settlement patterning and uh, changes in site function over time uh, by looking at lithic technology. But while he was at UIC, he took uh, a class with Bob Hall which kind of ignited his uh, interest in um, looking at the uh, other ways of interpreting the archaeological record. And so this has kind of been a, a side interest, as Brian described it, when he was doing the, 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 the dog work on the dissertation. He, he saved something a little bit fun to come back to, and the uh, looking at scapula mancy and uh, modified scapulas was uh, his little treat to keep him going. So he, today he's going to tell us a little bit about that. Thanks, Tom. Hey, thanks for everybody for coming out. Um, got a lot of interesting, pretty pictures I hope you'll find interesting. Um, yeah, so um, I did the standard dissertation research, counting, weighing, identifying tool types, but like Tom said, I'd come across some interesting um, reference to a burial or, a, or an artifact that was found, uh, usually scapulas. Um, but really no follow-up or no discussion of what they might have meant other than they're, they're examples of artwork and based on this style they're probably this old and that was sort of the end of the discussion. So um, I just kept collecting information over time thinking that the day will come and I can kind of pull it all together and maybe make a nice story. So um, I hope you'll find this interesting. So let's see. So just a quick discussion of a typical scapula bone. Uh, for those of us that are not faunal people, um, it's a, basically your shoulder blade. Um, it articulates with your upper arm bone, your humerus right here. And um, that's really all I need to say about it. Um, I will reference occasionally that uh, with some of these examples from the archaeological record, the this spine was removed. So when I refer to a, the, the spine being shaved off, that's, that's the part of the bone. And that's all I'll say about scapula bones. Um, so uh, this is what Europe looked like during the, the last glacial period. Most of the northern part of the, con the continent was covered in glaciers. Uh, there were some Alp alpine glaciers here and in the Pyrenees. And the sites that I'm going to be talking about are in this ice-free area here, from extending from Spain, France, into Central and uh, uh, Europe, Germany, Moravia, Czech, Czech Republic. And the two periods that I'm going to be talking about are the Gravettian and the Magdalenian period. Gravettian uh, is the earlier of the two periods. Uh, this map kind of shows their distribution, uh, again, through that ice-free area. And the Magdalenian is about 10,000 years later. Uh, again, kind of overlapping, but maybe not as extensive as the Gravettian site dis uh, distributions. Uh, so I'll start out talking about the Gravettian culture, the earlier period. Um, and I'm going to talk about sites in Austria and Moravia, uh, which is in part of what used to be called Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic. There are some sites in Russia, but I haven't had a chance to investigate those. There, apparently there are some scapula uh, <coughs> deposits there, but I just haven't had time to get into that. So again, the Gravettian, it's an early Upper Paleolithic industrial complex. Uh, it, 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 was, it dates to the major cold phase of the last glacial period. And there are regional variations in eastern France, uh, eastern Europe, in Italy and Greece, and in uh, Mediterranean Spain. And it's, usually it's just uh, uh, percentages of scrapers varied or slightly different tool types, but um, they're all generally lumped together as the Gravettian. Uh, the the, the uh, sites I'm going to be talking about are what's called the Eastern Gravettian. Um, this is a very interesting uh, Paleolithic complex. Um, it, and it indicates uh, greater economic specialization and social complexity than some of the other Gravettian groups in the area. Uh, mammoth hunting seems to have been a, a specialty. Um, they, they excavated uh, deep pits, which they filled with bone and used as uh, heating 
uh, <coughs> receptacles. Uh, they built quite comp what we would consider for the Paleolithic quite complex huts, semi-subterranean huts, uh, often built with mammoth bones. They did, um, they did produce um, some of the evidence from Czechoslovakia or, or Moravia shows that they were baking clay, making clay figurines. Um, I, I don't know if you remember Olga Sofer was once with the department and she was involved with um, the study of some of these big clay animal figurines which apparently were uh, <clears throat> being uh, produced to intentionally explode. <coughs> um, there are elaborate burial periods, uh, burials from this period. Um, you've probably all heard of the Venus figurines. They date to this time period. And there's uh, evidence of long distance trade in stone tools and uh, shells uh, across the continent. So here's just a, a map to show you the, uh, the spread of uh, Venus figurines throughout Europe. The famous one from Willendorf. Uh, here's just some example of the range of uh, these Venus figurines take, but again, typical of the Gravedian period. Um, this is one of the sites in Russia that I'm not going to talk about um, because this particular site, there were no burials associated with scapulas, but I just wanted to show you this to give you some sense of the level of complexity during uh, the Gravedian in some parts of Europe. Uh, this particular individual was, was buried with uh, 3,000 cut and drilled mammoth ivory beads. And then there was in the same, at the same site a, d a dual burial of a young a, a girl and a, and a young boy, um, also accompanied by cut and thousands of cut and drilled mammoth ivory beads. Uh, they produced uh, spears out of uh, mammoth tusks that they somehow managed to straighten, uh, and just a wealth of other grave goods that went in with these burials. Again, very unusual when we think of hunter gatherers during the Paleolithic, but a reflection of how complex these societies probably were. Um, I, I guess the closest analogy would be something like the Northwest Coast where you've got settled villages that are based on hunting and fishing, uh, maybe a similar type of uh, arrangement. So here, here are some typical Gravettian tools. These shouldered points are very characteristic of the Gravettian. Uh, then you've got back blades, denticulates, end scrapers. Um, okay, so the first area that I'll focus on in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Central Europe uh, is this area right here. This is, uh, here's the map of Europe with the inset, but this is the Danube River here that's coming down to Vienna. Um, and from the north, there's a, the Morava River, which drains this area, which is called uh, Moravia in the Czech Republic. And this is an area where the, the highlands, uplands, mountains, give way to the, um, this is the, uh, the, the, um, the Great Hungarian Plain down here, and this is the Vienna Basin. This was a very low area which was, um, uh, <coughs> has, has very thick loose deposits, and the Gravettians uh, established several sites in this area here. Uh, so the first site that I'm going to mention is this site, it's called Krems Vaktberg. <laughs> It's in this area of the Danube uh, called the Vakau, which is a, a very narrow uh, uh, canyon-like setting here before it opens up into the Vienna Basin here where it becomes very open and flat. Uh, and the site is right here, so it's right on the edge of the mountains uh, <coughs> bordering the, the, uh, the, the Vienna uh, Basin. What they found there about a little over a decade ago, uh, it's an open air site, but they did find a burial dated to 27,000 years ago, and the burial contained uh, two uh, uh, twin infants uh, covered with um, ochre. And what they had done is they had dug this pit and uh, buried the infants at the bottom, covered them with red ochre, and then covered them with a mammoth scapula and also a mammoth tusk fragment. Uh, what I found when I was doing this kind of work was that if, if they found uh, beads or, or um, animal teeth, something that looked like jewelry, they would tend to describe those as grave goods. But, um, and there'll be more examples of these in a minute, but whenever they found a mammoth scapula, they would mention it, but it was never discussed as part of a, potentially as part of a ritual or as a grave good. Okay, so if we go a little bit north of um, that particular site, up into um, Moravia in the Czech Republic, there's a couple clusters of sites here, Dolny Vestenitsi here, 
uh, uh, there's some other sites, isolated sites up here, Brno. Um, again, upland site, uh, Luss sites um, bordering the edge of these uplands, but that, situated down in the uh, Morava River, River Valley. Um, this is an example of a typical Gravettian structure from Dolny Vestinitsi and typical of Gravettian times. And uh, what these are are semi-subterranean houses. Uh, you can see here these dashed lines indica indicate that a basin was excavated in the ground. Uh, they had central hearths. There's evidence of post molds around the edges. Um, so this is very typical of these dwellings in this area at this time. And this is a reconstruction that gives you some sense of what they probably looked like. Circular ones, more rectangular type ones. But these are very common and you can see the mammoth bones scattered around here. So at Dolny Vestinitsi, there were a couple of burials that were very interesting. This was a burial number three. Um, it was initially exposed as a, a mammoth scapula, but when they removed the scapula, they found this uh, very tightly flexed burial beneath the scapula. And this is a reconstruction of um, what they think the burial looked like. It apparently was a woman, and her arms and her uh, legs were bound in this fashion. And there's the scapula that would eventually be placed over her. Uh, probably one of the more impressive sites in the area is from the site Predmosti in Moravia. Uh, this was a shallow pit that was excavated um, in the Lus, um, and it was uh, lined with ma mammoth scapula. Uh, a couple of them are indicated here. Uh, there were ash lenses throughout the pit. Uh, some of the human remains appeared burned. Uh, there were not many grave goods, uh, no evidence of ochre, which does show up at some of the other sites. And um, what they've been able to determine, because uh, the, the remains are not very well preserved, was that there were at least three, three females, three males, and a, a one 35 to 40, one 40 to 50 uh, year old male in this large uh, cemetery. Uh, that's a, a reconstruction of what they think it looked like. Uh, bodies in here, some mammoth scapulas around the, the periphery here and some mammoth mandibles also kind of stacked up along the, the perimeter. Um, some of the mammoth bones were decorated. This is a fragment of a scapula uh, with some zigzag lines and a mammoth tusk and a mammoth rib. So um, some people have argued that maybe it's because they were hunting so many mammoth that these bones are just ending up in there as refuse, being, you know, just because there's so many around. But this does indicate that they are actually uh, decorating the bones from possibly for some ritual purpose. Uh, another site a little bit to the north of uh, Predmosti was Pavlov 1. Um, again, it's similar to the Dolny Vestinci 3 burial. Uh, scapula was, uh, uh, mammoth scapula was found, and once they removed it, they found these uh, human remains underneath it. And probably the most impressive uh, site, or one of the more impressive sites in the area, is from a site called Bruno 2. Um, it was a middle aged man. Uh, with a, um, in a, in a depression that had been excavated in the ground, uh, lined with ochre. Uh, 600 dentalium shells were incorporated into the burial, uh, disc, small disks of stone, ivory, and bone. Um, kind of a strange artifact or was this right here. It appears to be like a marionette, a little, uh, little uh, like doll-like uh, figure with um, articulating arms that was buried with this person horse teeth antler, woolly rhinoceros remains, um, and then the uh, scapula of a young mammoth was found uh, near the skull of this individual. And this one's typically interpreted as a, sh a shaman's burial, just because of all the unusual items that were found with it. I don't know where that came from. I think that was artistic license. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, just as a brief summary of the Gravedian evidence regarding scapulas, uh, so they're all from open air sites. Um, there are cemeteries with mammoth scapula bones associated with them. Um, we have the full range of infants, subadults, and adults covered with mammoth scapulas. And aside from those few items with zigzag lines, they're, they're not really decorated or they don't show very much tr uh, uh, treatment, but they are clearly doing something to them to sort of make them unique. Uh, some of the scapulas do show evidence of burning. And again, I mentioned this earlier, but that, that spinal pro 
part has been shaved off on, on most of them. So it's clear that they are preparing these bones. I, you know, like I said, some people have argued that, oh, they're just getting in there because they're eating mammoth and they're just throwing them a, the refuse in with these burials. But it's clearly that they're, they're, they're treating these scapulas differently and, when, and incorporating them into the burials. Um, so there is a lot of evidence in the archaeological record going way back to the 19th century that uh, scapulas uh, are typically found as shovels. They're found uh, here in, in, in the New World. They're, clearly, they were used as um, hoes and implements like that. But in, in the Old World, they do find them going back to the Neolithic, uh, used as uh, mining tools to quarry out stone for uh, raw, raw material for stone tool. And, and then looking through, this is where I go kind of Dr. Hallish, looking around the world for other um, examples of, of scapulas used um, in the historic or archaeological record. On the northern plains, um, scapula hoes existed, but they weren't just used for gardening. They had a multiple range of, of um, not surprisingly, a function. So they, they did use them for gardening. They did use them to dig uh, cash pits. And if the earth lodge roofs had to be repaired, they would use scapula hoes to uh, chop out the, um, the, the, the uh, plant material and replace it. Uh, the Pawnee um, incorporated scapula bones into the Awari ceremony, which was a, a, a spring ritual uh, that was performed by women to encourage fertility and encourage the plants to grow. Uh, they stored these in four sacred shoulder blade uh, bundles, um, and they were, uh, so they, they kind of crossed the boundary between just functional artifacts for gardening in, into this sort of ritual realm. Uh, looking through some of the more local uh, evidence, uh, Utica, one of the middle woodland mounds, uh, had a sub-mound fire, what was called, identified as a sub-mound fire pit, and it contained a cache of utilized bison and deer scapula, which I found interesting because I don't believe agriculture was as intensive at that time. Uh, gardening was probably part of their, their round, but um, just the fact that they're burying hoes uh, in, a, in, a, in a human burial mound, I, I thought interesting and may say something about some sort of a ritual association. And again, in going back even farther back in time in Neolithic England and France, there's evidence that they're using the scapula as a shovel. So there's a pretty good uh, database of the um, use of these bones for uh, excavating and incorporating them into rituals. And here's that, that mound at Utica. I just include it for interesting uh, uh, graphic here. But here's the central tomb with the, the individuals buried in it. And then just off to the southeast, there was this pit that had a cache of, of uh, utilized hoes. I mean, they showed evidence of being used as hoes, buffalo and um, deer scapula. So again, some, maybe some implying some sort of a ritual association with death, burial, and, and, and scapula. So um, just to summarize the, uh, the uh, Gravedian um, data, um, so obviously these mammoth scapulas are probably too big to be used as, sh as a shovel. <laughs> but um, just thinking about it, um, um, I thought that, well, maybe what they're doing is they are using scapulas for everyday use, for digging pits, digging burials, digging those semi-subterranean house basins, uh, with probably with uh, deer and uh, reindeer scapula, and possibly making the connection between excavating into the ground, excavating graves, that these tools somehow have some association with the, um, uh, the spirit world, the underworld. And so you get a scapula of this size, then that's got to have some really strong power or connotation with the underworld. That's just my thought, my take on it, um, why they might be intentionally including these, these gigantic bones with, uh, with the burials. <clears throat> OK, so now we're going to jump into the future 10,000 years to um, the Magdalenian period. Trip on it. Um, so uh, the, the sites I'm going to be talking about are in this area called um, Cantabria, the Franco-Cantabria region here in southwest France and northern Spain, where there's just a wealth of 
sites with uh, caves, with paintings. You're probably all familiar with those. Uh, but then there's also tons of sites with not only paintings, but with portable art, uh, antler, decorated antler, harpoons. So it's a very rich area in Europe. So just briefly, the Magdalenian, it's later than the, the Gravettian, about 10,000 years later. Uh, blade technology, Buren scrapers, typical. Um, they did have a, uh, a, a very well-developed bone and antler technology, making barbed harpoons, awls, needles, shaft straighteners. You, you've probably seen pictures of these. Um, they did have elaborate burials with jewelry, and of course, they're, they're known for, their, for the cave paintings. And then these are just some examples of typical Magdalenian tools on these really well-produced blades, some end scrapers here, um, burins, burins here, some back blade lids, denticulates, some piercing tools here. So very typical uh, Magdalenian toolkit. And then these are some of the, the really unique bone and ivory tools, uh, antler tools that were produced. These barbed harpoons are very um, typical. These, these artifacts interpreted as shaft straighteners. Uh, some exotic shells that were used for um, uh, jewelry. And then these are just some of the, we'll talk more about these, some of these are fragments of decorated scapula. And of course the cave paintings are typical of Magdalenian times. Okay, so um, these are the sites that I'm going to talk about from this part of Europe um, during the Magdalenian. Uh, four sites in southwest France, two in, uh, in, in Cantabria in Spain. Um, just some summary information. Um, the scapulas from this period are primarily from cave and rock shelter sites. Uh, in 1983, uh, somebody did an inventory <coughs> of, uh, of sites in uh, Spain and France with uh, decorated scapulas and found that there were 22 sites at that time. I don't think anybody has updated this, so that this number could be uh, low now, but there were, at that time, 22 sites with decorated scapula bones. Uh, they tend to have naturalistic in engravings on them, uh, usually horse, deer, or bison, uh, but there are also geometric motifs, or what they call scribbles, where it's just hard to tell what they were doing. It's just You'll see some of those. Uh, they're often found in caches in remote parts of caves, and they're abundant at sites in the area that are, have been um, classified as super sites or aggregation sites. Uh, Mastazil, and El Casillo, and Altamira are three examples which I'll be talking about. And these super sites are interesting because they've been interpreted as seasonal aggregation sites uh, for uh, normally dispersed groups where they would come together and have rituals and festivities and try to strengthen the, link, the, link, the the social links between the, the groups that would be normally dispersed over the landscape. And uh, this is one thing that I was interested in. Is it possible that scapula bones could have been used in rituals at these super sites? So the first site, uh, the super site that I want to talk about is uh, La Mastazil in France. This is a huge cave site that um, has a river flowing through it and also now has a highway going through it. So there's the entrance on one side and the exit at the other. Um, here you can get some sense of the amount of deposits that they excavated from the site. These are the, this B and A are the two Magdalenian levels, so there were two Magdalenian occupations and then a more later um, Zillian uh, late Paleolithic occupation up here. But it does give you some sense of the amount of material in the site. So here, here's a plan view of the cave. Here is the route. It's 119 that goes through the cave. Um, there's a river that goes through, the, the Rees River goes through there too. And then there's a series of side chambers off to the south here um, where the um, <coughs> archaeological deposits were found. And these are really interesting. There's sort of an interconnected uh, series of chambers. Um, one that's particularly interesting here is uh, called the gallery, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, there were evidence of um, uh, rituals in a lot of these different spaces, but this is the area here that I'll be talking about in a second. So this is that area called um, uh, the gallery here. Actually, it's, it's, it's this little 
area labeled P. And within there, there was another area called the sanctuary uh, right up in here. And the sanctuary consisted of, a, of a, uh, an, an area that they called the chimney. And in the, so you can ba barely get your head in there, but um, it's a vertical shaft. And what they found in there was a, a, a cache of six large cut reindeer antlers. So again, it's kind of interesting. It's way deep in the cave, and they're clearly throwing them down here for some reason. Um, so again, stressing the, the, the role of rituals possibly being conducted in these interior chambers of some of these bigger sites. Um, from the site, they did find 60 scapula bones from that lower level. Half, half of those were decorated. They were clustered in a small area with few other artifacts. Um, this cave has been dug for uh, since like the beginning of the uh, 20th century, so the, the, the information is not what you would really like. So I can't say exactly where they were found, but they did say that they were clustered in an area within uh, the cave. Um, they de the uh, decorated ones depict horses, reindeer, bison, uh, 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 sheep, mountain sheep. Um, and some of them just have simple incisions or scribbles. And I've only been able to find one good image of one of the uh, scapulas, but this is an example uh, of a, apparently a horse engraved here and a smaller one here. Um, some scribbles on it too, but this is very typical of what, um, what these artifacts look like. Um, one other site, and I'm still kind of researching this particular site, I don't, I'm not sure if it's been classified as one of the super sites, but um, it was a site that produced a pretty large assemblage of scapula, uh, 17 of which had uh, primarily horse, horses etched in them, and about 30 with more abstract images. Uh, here's a, here's a, an example of a, of a, a a horse covered with these scribbles, you know, these sort of meaningless lines, or at least it's hard to interpret what they're trying to show here. Uh, a buffalo in, in profile here. Here you can see where they're cutting off that, that, that uh, spine. I'll just go through these pretty quick, just to give you some sense to see the back legs of some large animal, possibly a deer. Uh, this one had a bird on it, depicted on it. Here's one that's um, really covered densely with scribbles, but the, the uh, archaeologists were able to to um, identify horses and possibly a deer uh, with underneath all those scribbles. Again, all from that same cave. Um, okay, so moving on to this larger Ribas. There's a large cave site in, in southwest France. Uh, to relatively thick Magdalenian levels here, a lower one, uh, well this is identified as middle Magdalenian, this is later Magdalenian, separated by a sterile layer of rockfall, cavefall. Uh, it produced um, an interesting scapula with, um, show what appears to be a pregnant woman standing beneath a reindeer, um, and on the other side was a, a horse. So again, that, that's very unusual because you don't, they don't often depict humans in these, in these um, artworks. Uh, it's hard to see that one, but there is a supposedly an engraved horse on that one. Um, not, not as common as some of the herbivores, but occasionally they will find what appears to be uh, a, a carnivore. This is interpreted as a tail of a lion. Okay, so um, moving from France into Spain, um, on the north coast of Spain, in this area that's called Cantabria, uh, there are two sites, super sites. One is El Castillo here, and the other is Altamira here. So we'll go into France. So El Castillo is, again, one of the super sites, or identified as one of the super sites in, in Spain. It's very large. You can get some sense of the, the extent of the different chambers within the cave. It's, it's kind of right here at the top of the tree line on this, uh, this mountain. Um, here you can see, again, it was another site that was dug right, over 100 years ago, but you can get some sense of the, the amount of fill that they went through as they were excavating this site. Uh, they did find 33 engraved scapulas from the early Magdalenian levels uh, with red deer dominating. 
uh, followed by horse, fish, and bobbids. Here you can see some typical examples. It looks like a horse over there. Got some scribbles there. Uh, the next site is Altamira, which you're probably all familiar with. This is another one of these super sites or large um, aggregation sites. Um, and Altamira is very famous for its cave paintings here. Um, here's a map showing the entrance to the cave and gives you some sense of uh, how, how many uh, paintings there are in this cave as you go through it. Um, but this area right here is um, interesting in terms of scapulas. Uh, this is called the polychrome chamber or the, the hall of the bison. So you've probably seen these images. But that's this area right here. So here's the cave entrance as you come in. It's the first chamber on your left. Um, but the ceiling was decorated with these. Um, it, it's really kind of cool because these are not just painted on a flat surface, but they, they incorporated uneven uh, projections in the cave ceiling into the, um, to the body of the, of the bison. So like this hump right here might be an actual uh, projection from the ceiling of the cave. But what they found was when they were excavating uh, around the entrance to this polychrome chamber was a, um, a cache of seven engraved scapula uh, right near the entrance there. And one of the scapula was dated to about uh, 14,500 years ago, and they've since been able to date the paintings directly, so you can see that the scapula and the paintings are uh, pretty much contemporary. So um, <clears throat> I thought that was an interesting association with this uh, cave art, uh, potential area of ritual uh, associated with a, a cache of scapula. I haven't been able to find a lot of images of the scapula from the site, but uh, here's one that supposedly shows a, um, a red deer. Uh, you have to kind of stare at it for a while to see it. And then here's one that was broken into three pieces, which they refit, and they were also able to decode a, uh, a red deer, two red deer heads in there. But uh, I guess you have to really look at it carefully. Um, so um, that's the scapula evidence from uh, the Magdalenian sites. Um, one other thing that I, I looked at were what I call scapula surrogates, and these are called pla these are plaquettes and bone discs. And um, plaquettes are small, flat, decorated stones that have very similar decoration that show up on the scapula, and they have been equated with scapula. That they're, they're, it looks like they're using them for the same thing, so little flat things to draw animals on or, or, or naturalistic designs. The scribbles, and they do occur in abundance in areas that, that they'll often identify as sanctuaries, and it appears that they were burning these intentionally within deep parts of the caves. Um, so um, I thought that was interesting in light of what was going on at Dolni Vestanitsi back in the Gravedian when they were uh, making clay figurines apparently to intentionally explode and make a sound. Um, I thought maybe that's a similar thing that's going on here with an artifact that's potentially equated with scapulas, again, in, in deep areas of, of the caves. Um, bone discs, um, I, I thought, might also be the equivalent of scapulas. Um, they're mainly from the Magdalenian, but they do show up in the Gravedian. But these are um, very uh, thin, obviously very thin because they're made out of scapula bones. But they're, they're, uh, they also have uh, geometric designs and naturalistic de designs. And they're really too fragile to have functioned as uh, buttons for fastening clothes together. So the idea is that they were either used as pendants or sewn onto garments for decoration. And at some of the sites, you actually find the, the, um, the, um, the bones that were used to uh, produce the discs. They've got three out of this one here. But again, they're, they're so thin. They, they, probably wouldn't have been useful as actual clothing buttons. Uh, and these are just some examples. Uh, this one's kind of interesting because it's another case of, of a depiction of a human being, which you don't find a whole lot in Paleolithic art, but it seems like it's a man here. Um, they interpret it uh, as a, a bear uh, in, a, in a conflict with a bear or something here. And these are all from that, the site with the, the highway through it, Mastazil. Kind of make these out very nicely. 
but they're depicting the same animals on here that they're depicting on the scapula bones. So just to kind of pull together the Magdalenian evidence, um, we get decorated and undecorated scapulas from cave sites. Um, there have been reports of caches of these, these artifacts, and they, they seem to occur commonly at what, what are considered super sites or the aggregation sites. Um, and um, again, I, I've sort of postulated that possibly bone discs and stone plaquettes are functionally equivalent to scapulas because it seems like they're, they're, they're showing up in the same sort of context and doing the similar things with them. So, um, so I started thinking, what, why would scapulas, or why might they have been important to people? And I got into um, a research of the practice of scapulomancy, which is a, a, a form of divination. And basically, it's divination by the shape, color, or other characteristics uh, of um, marks, burns, or cracks in shoulder blades, or other flattish bones, tortoise shells. And there are basically, there are two types of, of scapulomancy. One is where um, the scapula is he heated, and um, uh, <coughs> the heating it will cause cracks or burn marks to form in the scapula, and the individual who's skilled at interpreting what that means will, uh, will, will tell people that this is a good sign, it's not a good sign, etc. cetera. Uh, and there's also what's called apyroscapulomancy, so it's not necessary that the bone would be burned or heated to, to learn something about the future from it. It could be once the bone is cleaned and dried, it, if, it, if it showed veins or color, color variations, those could also be interpreted as some sort of um, omen for the future. Um, we, <clears throat> we have a lot of um, archaeological and ethno ethnographic in information regarding scapulomancy. Um, the, the Cree Indians in um, Canada, who were hunters and fishers, uh, the the uh, Yakut uh, in or Iveni in uh, Siberia, who were ranger pastoralists, but also hunted and fished. Um, that's more contemporary. Going back into prehistory, we have evidence from the Shang Dynasty in China from this time period. They were agriculturalists, <coughs> and back into Neolithic China, seven to two thousand thousand BC also agricultural people, we have evidence that it extends all the way back at least that far. So for the, uh, there's, there's a, a very detailed by, uh, ethnography on the, um, the Nascapi from the 1930s, and there's a very good discussion of what, um, uh, how, how they performed scapulomancy and what it meant. But basically it was done amongst them to provide instructions for successful performance of hunts um, by vision dreams. Um, it would produce a map to guide the hunters to success. Um, it was a way to communicate with friendly animal spirits for successful hunts. Um, you could acquire information on the weather, on sickness, personal concerns, um, and an audible cracking sound and failure to, failure to burn was also a very good omen. And these are some examples that were recorded from amongst the Nescapi back in the 30s, just uh, once they've been burned, the kind of patterns that would be interpreted as a map or a, uh, an evidence of a good hunting location. Um, and this is a Yakut one, which you can see is very similar, the Yakut from Siberia, the Nescapi from Canada. Uh, again, very, very um, identical use um, of, these, of these artifacts. Uh, going back, into the archaeological period then. Um, in Shang, China, um, scapula manti was a very important part. And this was a, this was a, a, a civilized society. I mean, this was a complex society. Um, these people had big cities. They had armies. They had, they had uh, emperors. Um, but they still practiced this um, scapula manti for communicating with the ancestors uh, <coughs> to find out uh, you know, what, what would be a good time or place to hunt or fish, when would be a good time to take a royal journey, uh, weather, questions about the weather and when to harvest the crops, etc. So basically, they would use uh, scapulomancy for basically the same sorts of things that the ethnographically known hunter-gatherers were using them for. And I mean, they were into it big time. I mean, this is a pit from uh, one of these Shang period sites that's just full of these, it was just stashed with, um, I think these are 
they were using turtle shells uh, for scapula mansi, but I mean they, they were really into it big time. And this is a typical um, scapula oracle bone from Shang, China. What they would do is after they had the person, the, the specialist had, had performed the, the ritual and interpreted the signs, they would then uh, carve uh, what, what that particular bone predicted and then it would go into a, a receptacle like that pit you saw so that you could, you'd always know what, what they learned from this particular scapula based on what was inscribed on it. And then going back even farther in time, uh, we, we can extend the scapula mansi back into uh, the Neolithic in China. Uh, these are some examples that look very much like the, the ones from um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Nascapi and uh, the Yakuts uh, from historic times. But again, you can see they've, uh, these were found in a, in a pits, and they do have these marks caused by heating and burning. So again, I think this demonstrates a very uh, long period of the use of scapulas for these sorts of uh, rituals uh, involving divination. So taking all of that information together, I just made sort of a, a, a checklist here of what can the art Paleolithic record tell us about the possible use of scapulas and how, how they may have come to have those uses. So um, the, I think the archaeological record and the ethnographic record shows that no, no big surprise that shovels were used. Um, scapulas were used as shovels. I mean, that's really no big secret. Um, the archaeological evidence from Central Europe shows that um, they were they were digging holes in the ground. They were digging uh, large graves. They were digging subterranean, semi-subterranean houses. And um, I would imagine they would have used scapula for those sorts of uh, um, constructions. Uh, we know that from ethno-historic evidence, the, the, the bones are used to converse with the spirit world. And um, so there seems to be this association of scapulas, graves, the underworld, and the ancestors. And I would suggest that it goes all the way back to the Upper Paleolithic. I mean, we can pretty much trace it back to the Neolithic, and I know that's a big jump, but I think it's, it, it, it's, it's sort of um, po points that way, to, at least as far as I'm, uh, my interpretation. Um, Lewis Williams investigated a couple of sites in uh, cave sites in France, and he developed sort of a a, a model or a map of uh, how caves were used in, during the Paleolithic, and he determined or he concluded that the cave walls, based on paintings and other things, served as a, a membrane between the living world and the, the realm inhabited by spirits, animals, and uh, spirits themselves, and he. This is a diagrammatic representation, but here you can see a, a typical Upper Paleolithic cave, an idealized, idealized cave where you've got people living out here in the front. If, you know, if this is one of these super sites, possibly you know, the, the, the different groups of the, uh, of the society coming together for a, 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 a large festival during a particular season, using the cave, the interior of the cave um, for rituals. Um, Again, here's um, his interpretation of the cave wall as a membrane uh, with access to the spirit and uh, power of the spirit animals and a place where you would perform rituals. And I think this is sort of analogous to the situation in Altamira where they found the uh, cache of the decorated scapulas near that chamber with the, the uh, bison painted on the ceiling, kind of a similar place where rituals probably were performed. Um, that's all I got. So that's all I got. Those are sort of my musings and interpretations. And I know I, I did a typical Bob Hall thing around the world. And <laughs> but, but you know, it, it was frustrating just to just to see some of these uh, artifacts being interpreted just as they're pretty pictures of animals, and because they're drawn this way, they date to this time period. I thought there's got to be more to the story than that. So I hope that. Found that interesting, and anybody has any comments? Mm -hmm.